and welcome to Knit Tea Live at its brand new time, 12 o'clock Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern. I hope people find me today. I hope this stream works. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. According to YouTube, I have an excellent connection, but... Things have been crazy this morning, technology-wise, as per usual in my life. So we shall see. Um, <laughs> so got a lot today. Got a lot to talk about today. Because um, the truth is, I was going to do an unexpected Etsy today. I was going to, you know, go back through, scour Etsy, see what interesting, unexpected, weird things you would find. But I had so many great conversations today on this last couple days on Twitter that I really wanted to talk about them today. So uh, I'm not doing unexpected Etsy. <laughs> Instead, we will be talking about the need for speed, throwing shame, like throwing, like shaming people who throw what is English knitting, throwing, is flicking really all that different? Things of that nature. Why, why, why did Continental become this huge, like, mm, kind of snobby thing? Not that all Continental knitters are snobby. No, 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 not at all. But there is certainly has been over uh, the last 15 years, I'd say, I'd say going on 15 years now, this uh, opinion that Continental is somehow better, more accomplished, something. So we'll get into that. We're going to get into that. And also today we have a, I think going to be a longer, uh, pattern spotlight. Yes. Because the thing is with, uh, pattern spotlight, <laughs> I have like two weeks this past week. There weren't a whole lot of new pattern releases, or there's a couple, but the week before there was a lot. So we have a lot to catch up on. So hello, Jillian. Thank you so much. Evie, I'm getting used to it. I'm going to get used to that. Uh, I'm so excited for this one. I know I'm excited for this one too, because like I did a tweet rant. Was it just yesterday? Maybe it was Friday. I did this tweet rant and it kind of blew up a little bit. So, uh, yeah, but before we get into all that, I have, which if you've been following me on social media, you know this already, but we're going to talk about it anyway, which is the fact that yes, I have finally done it. I have made it. I have gotten to 1000 subscribers. Woo! <laughs> it was so funny. I, I feel like this past month, because I had to start working full time, and so I haven't been able to release as many videos and do as many live streams as I was. Like the YouTube algorithm is like going, I don't know about you right now. So I felt definitely like I was kind of like crawling, just crawling my way up to 1,000 subscribers. And thank you, Evie, thank you so much. Uh, I don't, I can't even. Oh, hello, Samantha. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for the congratulations. Um, so yeah, I finally made it to a thousand subscribers. I was very, 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 very excited. Um, and I, it was just like one new subscriber a day, two new subscribers a day. And I woke up one morning and there it was a thousand and two subscribers. And I was like, ooh, but I waited because you never know. Sometimes you lose people. Sometimes it's like this thing will happen with YouTube where it looks like you gain subscribers and then they immediately go away. And you're like, hmm? Hmm? okay. But um, yeah, it held and I was so excited. So I am now, not that, well, it'll affect you in the fact that now you will see ads with my videos because I did monetize. Um, <laughs> I can now watch the partial pennies roll in. <laughs> But yes, I did monetize my channel. Uh, you'll also may notice, I don't know what this looks like uh, on your end. I did turn on Super Chat. Uh, I think a Super Chat is kind of like 
live tipping. So if you like want to leave a tip while you're watching the video, you can leave a super chat and your thing will get pinned to the top of the thing, I guess. <laughs> it's a thing. But, uh, but I did turn it on just why not? And yeah, so that's, that's the big news. I'm now at a thousand subscribers. Uh, I now have ads running on my channel. I'm kind of playing around to see how I can get a good balance where you're not totally annoyed by them. Cause I'm a YouTube viewer too. I am a YouTube viewer. I know how annoying the ads can get. So, you know, Anyway, but it is a way to help support the channel. So uh, speaking of helping to support the channel, if you're watching now or if you're watching on replay, please give my video a thumbs up. Then feel free to comment down below if you're watching on the replay because uh, commenting, liking, sharing lets YouTube know that yes, people are enjoying this content. Yes, we wanna build the community and spread you to other people who will enjoy the content. So that's how, yeah. That's how, I guess, the YouTube algorithm works. <laughs> okay, so let's get into it. I'm going to check something real quick. Oh, one more thing. One more. Oh, you know what? I'm going to, sorry. I have this app running on my computer. I'm going to just turn that off. Um, I want to make sure that's set up and just checking over. Okay, so. Yes, get that coin. <laughs> yes, let it rain. Let it rain, quarter pennies. <laughs> uh, oh, so um, there was one more thing before we get in. No, you know what? I'll do part way through. I do have a finished project to show off today, but we'll do the topic first, then we'll do finished object, then we'll do powder and spotlight. So, <gasps> Evie! Oh my goodness, thank you so much. <laughs> Evie just gave me a super chat of $5, that's so sweet. She wrote, I've so enjoyed following your channel, learning from you and hearing your perspective, congratulations. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, oh gosh, I, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm just so overwhelmed. If you wanna know the truth, I'm overwhelmed. Um, because it's always so awkward. It's always so awkward being like, can I pass my hat around? It's, it, it is always a little bit of an awkward thing, but it's also a necessary thing because um, I gotta, I, I have to pay for supplies. In fact, oh, I forgot it. I have squishy mail, I had squishy mail. We might have like a little brief pause at one point for me to go run and get it, we'll see. Anyway. But yeah, I have squishy mail on the way. I've like, I kind of had a year off with no yarn and I've made two purchases of yarn lately. But anyway, uh, let's talk about the need for speed. <laughs> Why is there this overemphasis? That's what I will call it. I think that there is a overemphasis in knitting when it comes to how fast you can knit in terms of stitches per minute. Um, Cause let's be honest, there's a few ways, there's different ways you could measure how quickly you are knitting. One is like say, how long it takes you to do an average project, like a scarf, an average size scarf. How long does it take you to knit a garter scarf? You could use that as your measurement of speed. You could use, I, I like knitting socks. Generally, if I'm really like uh, focusing hard on it, like, well, fo it's not about focusing hard, this is knitting. Well, it depends on the knit stitch pattern. But anyway, if I'm really spending, dedicating more time to a particular project, a sock project, I can finish a sock project probably the first sock, depending on the size needle that I'm using, in two or three days. If I'm really like, really going, dedicating a good amount of time to it, then the second sock normally takes me longer because I'm, second sock syndrome is real. Uh, but, oh, uh, a good measurement for me is my dishcloth, my round dishcloth that um, my grandmother used to always knit and then I knit and I don't have one nearby, but if you've ever signed up for my mailing list, you got a copy of that pattern. Uh, that I can knit in like, 
in a plane trip. On a California to North Carolina plane trip, I can hit one dish cloth. So that's about uh, four to five hours. <laughs> so I think I knit probably a pretty good clip. But one thing about that in terms of knitting and how fast you complete a project, uh, it's not just about how many stitches per minute you can knit. If you're looking at, you're judging the speed of your knitting by how quickly you finish projects, there's a lot more to it than just knitting how many stitches per minute you can work. There's how well you can follow a pattern. There is how easily, how few, how many mistakes you might make. Uh, I can tell you right now, uh, many, many a project has been stymied simply because I had a frog back multiple times. In fact, I started a new sock uh, project for science reasons. There's scientific reasons. I'm not going to get into it right now, what those are, but it pertains to my upcoming nine inch circular review. Okay, I'll just tell you. Uh, <laughs> I started knitting a sock on Thursday night on a nine inch circular uh, to see what it would let. I got a size one and a half nine inch circular to see what it would be like to knit on needles that tiny with yarn that tiny with a nine inch circular because I'm doing a nine inch circular review that's actually gonna be my upload next Friday. Uh, that Thursday night, I uh, I probably tried casting on that project and getting it started about five times. And I thought I got it started, went to bed, woke up, realized still didn't do it correctly. <laughs> five, I think about seven times I cast it on, joined in the round, and then realized I had not cast it on the correct number of stitches. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, six to seven times of casting on stitches <laughs> and miscounting them uh, will delay your knitting far more than maybe being a slightly slower knitter. So, but it does seem like, I feel like, based on comments that I have seen on various platforms, that many knitters feel like the ultimate, or at least a very important measurement of how accomplished a knitter you are, is how many stitches per minute you can knit. And it's bunk. <laughs> In my opinion, this is utter bunk. Uh, I, on Twitter, what I said was that there are extraordinary knitters who can ex who can knit at incredible speeds. Uh, I believe it's Hazel Tyndall, who is a knitter from Scotland. She does Shetland knitting. That is the type of knitting where you support the right needle. It's lever knitting, like what I do, but... I believe that she uses a Macon, which is a, uh, it's a, a Macon belt. It's from the Shetland Islands. And it is a leather, it's a belt with a leather pouch that holds holes in it. And the, a needle gets stuck into that hole and that Macon or Macon, I'm not sure how the pronunciation is, holds the needle. So then the right needle is supported so that your left hand can just Act as a shuttle, loading and unloading stitches off of your needle while your right hand throws the yarn or flicks the yarn. She can do this incredibly quickly. She has been clocked at doing, I think it's 262 stitches per minute. That is an extraordinary speed. That is an Olympic level speed. That is not what most knitters are going to be able to achieve or maybe even should achieve because sometimes when you're knitting really quickly you're not paying as a close of attention and you're actually making more mistakes that you're going to have to fix so um the way i described it it's if you are a just a a crafter i don't really like the word hobbyist but if you're a crafter and a casual knitter 
and you are trying to measure your knitting speed by someone like Hazel Tyndall, that's like a weekday jogger trying to compare their, um, you know, mile by Usain Bolt. It's, it's an unreasonable comparison to make for yourself. Um, but a lot of knitters have gotten caught up in this idea of, I need to knit faster. If I knit faster, A, I'll be a better knitter, and B, I'll get more projects done. That's the other reason, right? A lot of knitters are like, if I could just knit faster, I'll get more projects done. Do you think this is true? I'm gonna go back to the other thing. There's a lot of factors that go into being able to finish a project in what time frame you think is a a fast time frame and how many stitches per minute that you knit I think is actually one of the lower down on the list of factors that's going to help you finish projects more quickly making fewer mistakes so that you don't have to tink or frog back as often is going to get you to the end of your project much more quickly uh being able to accurately read a pattern and be comfortable with reading a pattern so you don't have to spend a lot of time deciphering that pattern it is going to get you through a project much more quickly uh you know there's just there's a lot of things that we can do as knitters that have nothing to do with how quickly our hands move that can help us create be more productive knitters if that is your goal to get through more projects but even that i sit there and i'm like do we why do we feel this need, this pressure to get through more projects, right? Like, is it is it because you feel like you need to keep up with the Joneses? Where you see all these finished objects on various Facebook groups and you're like, I feel like I never get to post my finished object because I never have one. I, I can fall into that trap because I admit, I'm not the most productive knitter in terms of finished objects. I've got so many whips, <laughs> I have so many whips, that uh, there's long stretches where I haven't finished anything, but I'm constantly knitting. But I guess in some ways I'm more of a process knitter, that's me. But the other thing too is you're more likely to finish a project quickly simply by dedicating more time to your craft, if you have more time to dedicate. Hello, Mr. Me. I forgot to say hi to you. Congrats. It seems a little like buying a faster car to try to cut down your commute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is a really great analogy, Mr. Me. It is like trying to drive to like buy a faster car um, to get through your commute. There's always going to be things that are in your way, no matter how fast that engine is going. One of the really interesting things when I was on the Twitters and this conversation was going on that Kathleen Sperling actually pointed out is that, uh, and Kathleen Sperling is a continental knitter, and she said that a lot of times she actually needs to slow herself down when knitting. Because if she starts knitting too quickly, too fast, she makes more mistakes. And I think that's very common. Uh, there's times where I get into a zone, and I'm just like, oh man, I feel like my hands are flying. And then I stop, and I look what I've done, and it's like, oh. Yeah, I missed a few things along the way because I wasn't really paying attention and now I need to frog back. What does it matter if I had, if I finished a row in a minute, right? If I then have to spend five minutes undoing that row, I'd be better off spending a minute and a half on a row. <laughs> Depending on, I mean, I'm just making up numbers, but you get what I'm saying. And I think the thing about it is, if you were somebody, and somebody rightfully pointed this out, there's nothing wrong, per se, if you are a knitter who wants to challenge yourself to increase your speed. If, if you just think it's cool and you like the feeling of it, there's nothing wrong with that unless you're hurting yourself in the process. You know, if, if trying to create that type of speed is causing you injury, then that's an issue. But otherwise, get on with your bad self. Try to knit faster. But I think that the idea that we need to let go of and what I was sort of railing against in my Twitter was more about this idea that one, knit, like I said, knitting speed being the like barometer 
of how good of a knitter you are because it's not it's not what makes you a good knitter is the quality of the work itself like I always say the three things that matter is are you enjoying your knitting are you getting the results that you want and are you pain free if you're hitting those three things you're a great knitter it doesn't matter how quickly you knit in the process and I always feel a little hypocritical when I talk about this because I do have and I will have more of <laughs> I will uh videos titled knit faster knit faster ribbing knit faster with lever knitting and I call them those videos because I know that will attract viewers to the video and unfortunately that's part of the game that you play when you are a YouTube creator is you have to create clickbaity titles hopefully it's not clickbait in the sense of I'm actually delivering on the promise that I'm making which is like I will show you a way to knit that will help increase your speed but to me it's not so much about crease increasing speed as so much about increasing your efficiency and your proficiency in being able to do your craft if you're interested in learning those things but I do try to, in those videos, then talk about how speed is not the most important thing in terms of judging your knitting. It really is much more about, um, are you enjoying your work, quality of your work, judged by you, what, if you're happy with the results, not about what anyone else thinks about it, because there are no knitting police, you are the boss of your knitting, you get to decide if you're happy with the project, and if it brings you joy. Nobody else gets to have that say unless you want them to. And of course, if you're pain free. Jillian, my 11 year old is listening in. He said, oh, she's talking about my triangle. Quality, fast and cheap, but you can only have two. Absolutely. Uh, I work in production <laughs> and we talk about that all the time. The triangle of expectation. Um, in terms of crafting, you can have quality and it can be fast, but it won't necessarily be cheap now what that might be in terms of crafting might be you might pay in terms of like stress that you put on your body um but yeah that is that is exactly a very good analogy as well um i was going somewhere i lost my train of thought a little bit as i'm ranting about this but yeah i just feel like we have and some of it, let's be honest, I think that there was a period of time when we, when knitting, the knitting peeps, peoples, were trying to attract new knitters. And one of the ways to do it was to do these sorts of knitting competitions and these speed knitting competitions. There's a really cool one from Australia from like the 1960s that actually helped me diagnose a uh, flaw in what I was doing. I have a video about it. I will link it down in the description box after after the live stream. But uh, I think some people started to take that as, oh, you're supposed to be able to knit that quickly if you're a good knitter. I know what the other thing I was going to say. The other thing I was going to say is learning a certain amount of proficiency and efficiency in how you knit, no matter how you knit, is going to help speed things up in terms of your knitting, but I think that speed is a byproduct of experience. Speed isn't necessarily a great goal in and of itself. That's my opinion. Again, if your aim, if you want to, for whatever reason, you enjoy the challenge, want to work towards gaining more stitches per minute, hey, it's your knitting life. You get to make that goal for yourself. But I think that if you're wanting to make that goal for yourself because then you feel like you'll have become a more accomplished knitter, just know that if you don't make that goal, you're not you're no less of an accomplished knitter. You know? <laughs> you're no less of an accomplished knitter. Just like a runner is no less of an accomplished runner because they don't run as fast as Usain Bolt. Because most Olympians, I think he still holds the world record. So even other Olympians don't run as fast as Usain Bolt. And, like, that's fine. It's fine. Uh, it's fine. But the other part about this, and this is the thing that really, really is my issue. I mean, 
that stuff is my issue, but this is my real issue. And that is Jillian. I saw this speed competition. Notice they finish as fast as they can, but then deduct by mistakes. They didn't stop and fix anything. Yes, that's absolutely true. They did. And, you know, the thing about it is that particular competition, I do believe that it was a continental knitter, a picker, uh, who won. But I don't, I haven't seen anything in terms of what her speed was. And did she win because she had the, she actually knitted the most stitches per inch? Or did she win because she got the right balance of speed and no mistakes? I don't know. You don't know. And the thing about it is, everybody in that competition, no matter which way they were knitting, were knitting very fast. I mean, it's unreal watching it. Um, and that brings me to my next point. You might hear my daughter that got home. <laughs> I just heard her door slam. You might hear it too. Anyway, this brings me to my next point, which is this is the thing that really bugs me. This is the thing that gets me, gets stuck under my craw. It is this messaging that has happened over the last 20 years. I've watched it of if you want to be a faster, better knitter, you need to switch to Continental. That's the only way to really knit quickly. That's the only way that that's the best type of knitting. Throwing, so inefficient, so slow. Like, it's like baby knitting. <laughs> That's, I have seen this attitude around throwing, and it, it does. It ticks me off because A, not true. B, it, I've seen, I've seen it. I've seen the comments from people, from uh, whatever you want to call it, English knitting, throwing, flicking, whatever. Um, cause honestly flicking and throwing are the same thing, but whatever. Um, almost being apologetic. Like I know Continental is supposed to be more efficient, but I just, I just really, I'm, I'm a thrower and I've tried Continental doesn't work for me, but you know, I'm just a thrower. And it's like, why are you apologizing for being a thrower? And it's because there has been this attitude that has developed this sort of snobbery and, you know, I'm not calling out anyone specifically on this, by the way, but it is out there. It exists. And there are subtle ways which I think it gets pushed. Craftsy. Uh, it still exists. Whether it's as good or not is another matter, but it still exists. Craftsy. They have a video. They have a class. Knit Faster or Continental. They have a class. Knit Faster or Portuguese. You know what they don't have a class of? They don't have a class of Knit Faster with Throwing. They don't have a class for knit faster with English knitting. They don't have knit faster with lever. Why? Because there's this attitude that people aren't interested in it because at the end of the day, Continental is better and faster and more efficient. And it's not necessarily. I'm sorry, it's not necessarily. Um, I just don't, I don't think so. That's my opinion. As someone who started off as kind of a traditional English thrower, learned how to knit continental, then learned how to lever knit and can Portuguese knit. Then I'm all, I can tell you from my personal experience, it depends on what you're calling efficient. What is efficiency? Continental knitting, I will say, in terms of the knit stitch, has a smoother motion it is kind of like, it does feel like it's all one motion of kind of putting in your right needle, grabbing the yarn, and then pulling it back out. Whereas in English knitting, it's a little bit more of like a stepped process. Um, even the way that I teach lever knitting in my video on lever knitting, it is very much like this stepped process. And I break it down because you kind of have to learn each part of the motion before your fit hands can really do the dance where it's all one, feels more all one continuous thing. You know, it's like a little, <laughs> catch up with some comments. Uh, Mr. Me, it's kind of funny when I started knitting, people always ask me how long things took to make. I almost feel bad about not timing myself. Although your knitting faster video is how I found you. Yeah, right? Like I truthfully in some ways am very unaware of how long it takes me to knit something. Um, because I very much am a little, 
I don't want to, what's the term I'm looking for? I'm a little scattered when it comes to knitting. I'm very like, I work on this for a little bit, then I put that down, and I work on this little thing and this for a little bit, and then I put that down, and I pick up the next thing, and I work on that for a little bit, and I just have my rotation of works in progress, and eventually one of them gets finished. <laughs> and that's how I roll. Uh, Samantha, I consider myself a slow knitter, and I knit continental style. I'm not bothered by my speed since I knit to relax. Exactly. And, you know, the thing is, I think that's an aspect of it as well, which is a lot of us, we're knitting to relax and to enjoy it. I myself, for me, what I love about knitting, I love the feeling my hands moving. Uh, you might notice I'm a bit of a hand talker. I have, since I was a baby, apparently, had a thing about moving my hands. My mom says that I was in a crib and I just put my hand up in the air and just move it and watch it. And I totally think I know what was going on with me even as an infant because I still do the same thing now. And knitting gives me that feeling of moving my hands just gives me a sense of relaxation and pleasure. And whether I'm knitting quickly one day or slowly one day, I get that same thing. Um, and I think that's probably, I feel like that's true for a lot of people who are into these sorts of very like handcrafting things. Um, crafts, handcrafting crafts. <laughs> but there's another aspect of this too. And it's actually, I was thinking about it with Evie this morning because Evie a while back talked about uh, spinning and how, you know, back in the days, the b b before, 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 before times, people didn't weave as a hobby. They weaved for livelihood. They weaved because they needed cloth. <laughs> and so it was like cooking. It was something you needed to be able to do. And, you know, it wasn't just something that was done for pleasure. And, you know, when you're doing something for survival, there is a need for speed. Here's the interesting thing about that in terms of knitting. Uh, knitting is a practical skill. It creates practical items. And, you know, I don't know the exact timeline of when continental knitting developed versus when uh, throwing developed. I'm trying to... Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Um, I don't know the exact timelines, but I do know that English style throwing, that style of knitting has been around for a very, 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 very long time. And if it was inherently slow and inefficient and couldn't be done quickly, it would not have survived because people needed to get their garments knitted, you know? <laughs> but here's the thing about it, and this is, I think, part of the problem in terms of this attitude that it has developed about picking versus throwing. I think a large portion of it has to do with the fact that throwing hasn't necessarily been well taught the last 20, 30 years. Um, as somebody said in, my, in the discussion on Twitter, said a lot of people's thoughts about throwing is still kind of the beginner's way when you first start to learn how to throw where you take your right needle and you stick it in and then you pick up the yarn and you throw it around the needle and then you pull it out and then you drop the yarn and that. And there's some people who still knit that way and they get great results and that's fantastic. But that is sort of the beginner's version of throwing. But, and that's how I started off when I was first learning how to knit because you're just trying to get the basic motions down. But once I got comfortable with that, then I learned how to tension the yarn in my hand and I gained more speed because I wasn't dropping the yarn and then picking it up. I was keeping it on my finger. And now this has started to become called flicking and you can find videos about flicking and all flicking is it's English knitting, it's throwing, it really is. The, the difference is just you tension the yarn in your hands and you don't let go. And actually, my second video on lever knitting, you could call that flicking. You could easily call that flicking. You start doing that, you gain more speed. The next thing about English knitting, if you want to gain more speed, all, 
stop using your right needle to stab into the stitch. Use your left needle like the shuttle to load stitches on and off so that all your right hand is doing really is throwing the needle, throwing the stitch. You do that, you're gonna gain more speed more likely. So there are things that we can do and that are done with English knitting we call it lever knitting, we call it Irish cottage knitting, but these are all variations of English knitting, of throwing, that makes it just as fast as continental knitting. But here's the other thing about continental knitting, and the thing I find bizarre in terms of this whole argument that continental is more efficient, and again, like I said, I think for picking the stitches, for knit stitches, it is a smoother motion. I can see why people would say it's more efficient for them and they enjoy it. But then you get to the purl stitch. Some, many, 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 many pickers are perfectly great and happy and have found a way to do the purl stitch that works great for them, right? But even Elizabeth Zimmerman, who was the huge proponent of continental knitting and was the one who claimed that it was more efficient than throwing. Who I feel like is responsible for this whole kind of attitude that has developed. Sat there in her books and talked about how she didn't like purling. And there are, it's so, it's like, okay, so the knit stitch, maybe it's more smooth, but is it easier to purl? incontinental? <laughs> I don't think so. And I think what it comes down to is no matter how you knit, there's going to be pros and cons to any style of knitting, right? Whether it's throwing, picking, tensioning it around your neck, however you knit, there's going to be pros and cons to both types. Everybody has to find the style and the methods and the techniques that work best for them. But what we need to stop doing is to try to rate any of them as better than another and not shame people into thinking that that they should switch their style of knitting if they're happy with it and that i think is the thing because let's stop having throwers feel like they need to be apologetic if a thrower comes in and tries to make the switch to continental for whatever reason and is like, I'm having a really hard time with the pearl and I just don't know if I'm ever going to get it, let's be willing to say to them, it's okay, you don't have to knit continental if you don't want to. There's ways that you can improve how you already knit to get results that you're looking for. You know, there's adjustments that you can make if you're looking to make them. You know, but so often... Throwers will get into forums and be like, I like to knit faster. And the message they get is, well, you got to switch to continental. That's the only way. And it's not. It's not. It's not. Jill, Evie, it would be interesting to look at the pre-YouTube vintage teach yourself to knit books to see what methods are more popular. Yeah, I mean, you know, these things have kind of come and gone. I know that I have heard that. I have heard from the herds places, the places that you hear from, that in the United States, pretty much like World War II on, you pretty much only saw English style knitting, that there was sort of an attitude about continental knitting because it was seen as German. So um, that's kind of interesting. And, I, and you have seen a resurgence of continental knitting which, don't get me wrong, it's great. And I'm glad I know how to knit Continental. I love that I know how to knit Continental. I learned how to knit Continental because I wanted to do stranded color work and be able to hold yarn in both hands. Because frankly, doing stranded color work, holding both strands in your right hand is kind of a pain in the tulkus. Although, you know, the Shetland knitters, Fair Isle, hello. They obviously, knitting finds a way. Let's just put it that way. Knitting finds a way. <laughs> Kathleen, as you describe a lot of this, I realize there's a lot of it that I picked up without realizing. I don't entirely load the stitches with my left needle, but it doesn't stay totally still. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was watching Fargo the other night, um, or at least the beginning of it before bed, and the wife who gets kidnapped, she actually is knitting. Uh, don't the scene where she gets kidnapped she's knitting on the couch and I started watching her knit and she was kind of doing this English throwing but what was so interesting was 
she was stabbing with her right needle, throwing the yarn, and then with her left needle, kind of unloading the stitch. It was really interesting to watch. It, it, it was a little painful. I was being a little judgy about it. I admit it. I was being a little judgy. It looked like someone who had never knit before. <laughs> I, I admit I got a little judgy. I recognize my opinionated nature. Thank you. But yeah, I just, you know, I would like to see us where we just embrace the way that people knit. And if the, somebody is looking to, I mean, and don't get me wrong, this is the other thing. There's people who made the switch from English to Continental and they love Continental more. That's wonderful. It's always wonderful when you find a way to knit that you love. And I actually encourage all knitters to try different ways of knitting. I think English knitters can benefit from learning to knit Continental as well. I think Continental knitters can learn benefit from learning how to knit English style knitting as well. You know, um, all of us have different bodies <laughs> and different preferences and it really is about personal preference. And even in like what Kathleen was kind of alluding to, to some degree, I think is very true, which is even like there's these broad styles, everybody's still going to bring their own spice to it. Everyone's still going to bring their own variation to it. And if you are enjoying the way you knit and you're getting the results that you love and you're pain free, then keep on knitting with your bad self. Like, and Let's not shame people for how they're knitting, no matter how they're knitting. Let's not shame people over it. Let's not let not let's not treat this as a gatekeeping thing. And if throwers don't want to knit continental, you are still an amazing knitter. You are. I'm here. You get, like feel free to tell it. Carrie Craft Geek, who now has a thousand subscribers, said, "I'm still an amazing knitter." <laughs> Evie, thanks for this topic, Carrie. I had to go, but I love your message. No more knitting technique shame. That's right. Thank you, Evie. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the super chat. Um, if you don't know, if you're coming in late, I am now monetized. Uh, I reached a thousand subscribers a couple weeks ago. Um, and if you're interested in leaving me a tip or helping to support the channel, uh, you can you can use the super chat function on YouTube to do it. Um, you don't have to. But if you do, a neat little mes message gets pinned up to the top, and I see it. And anyway, I I feel sh I feel some kind of way having to plug these things. Anyway, um, I think that's everything I need. I feel like I need to say. I feel like I've gone on and on and on about this, but um, it is I think a really important topic. I feel like I've talked about it before. I'm sure I will talk about it again. Um, uh, and if you're not following me on Twitter or Instagram, please feel free to follow me there where these conversations often take place. You can find my social media down in the description box. Um, but yeah. So who is ready for some whip? It's not a whip. It's a finished object. Well, it's mostly finished. I have to weave in some ends, but <laughs> who's ready to see a mostly finished object? Um, it's not like anything big, but since I was like, I haven't finished that object, I'm going to show it off. And I'm just going to come over here to this here. And there we go. So this is my finished object. And, uh, oh, can I move this? Probably not. Sorry. Okay. There we go. <laughs> that way the, the, the text box doesn't appear like right on top of me. So this, these are my wrist warmers. Obviously I still need to weave in ends. Um, this is a, such a simple project, but I enjoyed doing it thoroughly. These are just two by two ribbing where uh, I got to the end of my cuff and knitted back and forth for a few rows rejoined in the round, and then knitted the rest of the way up. Uh, I started this project as a way of testing out my 9-inch circulars. Uh-huh. Yes, these lovely little bad boys. Uh, I mentioned earlier, but I will mention again, that 
next week I will be uploading my review of the nine inch circulars, what it was like to knit with them. Uh, one glove I knitted with the nine inch circular and then the other glove to kind of compare techniques I knitted with the, uh, with, whoops, magic loop. <laughs> my, my un woven in ends are just flinging everywhere. Wee. But, uh, yeah, so this is the project that I finished. I really, you know what? I really enjoyed this project. Super easy. I didn't bother with a thumb. It was kind of fun just to do a wrist warmer. This is such an easy thing to do if you want, like, a quick, fun project. It's just a really basic tube where you leave a hole for your thumb. And it's just, like, it's kind of mindless knitting in a way. I use 2x2 two two ribbing, but you could use, like, any sort of ribbing pattern. But the nice thing about doing it with the ribbing is then you don't need to build in gussets because the fabric has, like, enough elasticity in it to do it itself. Uh, and this was knitted with, I know, I have so much of this. This was knitted with Knit Picks Wool of the Andes because I have... I have a lot of it. I have a lot of it. So I'm always sitting with it. <laughs> so that's my finished object. I'm going to, I need to weave in the ends. I'm going to do that today after the live stream. Weave in my ends and wash them. And block. Although not pin block, but it'll be a light block. Anyway. All right. So uh, that is the, oops, sorry. Oh, I know the problem is my mouse was turned upside down. Webcam, we're gonna switch over to here. There we go. So we are now going to do Pattern Spotlight. Ooh. I'm really excited about this week's Pattern Spotlight, if you wanna know the truth. Um, I just wanna make sure I'm in the right place on my thing before I switch all this up. <sighs> do, 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 do. Yeah, so uh, I feel like there's just, oh no. Okay, I'll just go here first. Sorry, something didn't load properly. So I'm just making sure. Oh, there they are. Budge. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. I just wanna get this set up before I click over so you don't have to watch a whole bunch of page loading when I do this. <laughs> All right, uh, I gotta turn this off. There we go. And sh desktop share. There we go. All right, so first pattern. This is a new pattern that was just released this weekend from KBJ Designs. This is her Cadence Fingerless Mitt. It is a, oh, what does she call it? an almost matching, almost matching pattern to her Cadence sock. Uh, oh God, I just feel like I love fingerless gloves. I'm really into fingerless gloves at the beginning part of this year, and I just think this is a really lovely one. It features a textured rib pattern that starts at the cuff, and then uh, goes up, and it has these nice lacy details that go across the front of the hand and it's just a lovely lovely pattern uh this is on she has this for purchase on her pay hip store um so you can find a link for that at knitswordsat.com slash fiber happenings because fiber happenings now has its own page on my website um so yes let's see let me oh Oh, no, it's her Etsy store. My apologies. I mislabeled the button. I got to fix that. Uh, it's an Etsy store. She has an Etsy, and that's where they are for purchase. So you, we can look at some more photos, and you can get an up-close view of them here. Isn't that pretty? Like this little bit of, like, just textured ribbing. And I love this photo. And you can see we can zoom in a bit more on the lace you can see the lacy detail um so this is just a little bit of a touch of lace uh, i think this totally would be a great project for um an adventurous beginner or someone with, who has more experience who just wants a little bit of fun along with some good relaxing knitting i love fingerless gloves especially in the springtime because especially at night at least where i live in los angeles at night, a lot of times it gets a little nippy, and it's nice just to have a little extra warmth on your wrist. 
Uh, do, 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 do. I'm gonna go back to my webcam as I set up the next pattern. We're gonna go down. Oh, this is really, really, this is pretty. Well, everything's pretty. <laughs> Everything is pretty. Everything is pretty. Here uh, is a new shawl pattern from Lotta Grover. It's called the Nereid. And this is a shallow triangle shawl. But, according to Lotta, uh, it has a non-traditional construction. Uh, it's worked from the center out so that you knit the border and the body of the shawl at the same time. So uh, for this, it features basic lace knitting and some provisional cast on, and uh, there is some embroidery technique as well. Let's check it out on her Hey Hip store so we can see even more photos. So here you can see the uh, triangle shape. And I love these photos when they show you how you can drape the shawl because I think shawls are really fun to knit, but I think sometimes people are a little stymied about how to wear them. And I think this is a lovely picture to show how you can drape the shawl on. So it looks like, you know, a nice modern accessory and not like your grandma's shawl. Although my grandma too wear shawls. It's such like an outdated idea. Here you can see up close of the lace border, which I think is so cool. Um, it's something that is lacy, but it doesn't feel old fashioned. There's something that feels very modern about these lines of eyelets that I really, really like. So that is her latest pattern. Do, 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 do. I know. Uh, and then next up, website, let me close that. Oops, there we go. All right, uh, from Periwinkle Dragon, oops, wrong one, there we go. From Periwinkle Dragon, she has a new sock pattern out. This is, oh, I hope I pronounced this right, the Carolinas sock, Carolinas, Carolinas socks. Uh, and this sock features, as often is the case with Periwinkle Dragon, features really neat, uh, what looks like a slip stitch pattern that gives a really nice texture. Her patterns a lot of times are really great for variegated yarns. Sometimes it feels, variegated yarns are so pretty, but sometimes it's a little like, what do you do with them? Well, I think Periwinkle Dragon does such a good job. Carol um, Lyle, Carolyn Lyle does such a good job of utilizing variegated yarn, creating kind of textured patterns that really utilize that variation color in the yarn just really, really nicely. Um, so yeah, it's a very cool sock pattern. It looks like, I believe that is a strong heel. I believe these socks are designed with comfort with ribbing throughout, contain spiraling elongated stitch details. They are knit toe up with a gusset. In, oh no, it's a gusset and heel flap, but it's knitted toe up. So um, that is lovely, lovely, lovely. I'm kind of moving quickly because I talked a lot today uh, about <laughs> knitting speed. Uh, oh, this is exciting. This next pattern, let me click that. This next pattern I'm actually very excited about. Um, oh shoot, back here, there we go. Uh, this is from Akalori Designs. She uh, is a Tunisian crochet designer, and she has come out with a cardigan. This is called the Pebbles Cardigan. Uh, a lot of times with Tunisian crochet projects, you find a lot of like shawls and of this nature, so it's fun to see like a wearable garment. Uh, and it uses uh, Tunisian simple stitch and Tunisian pearl stitch um, in the pattern and it is a close fitting cardigan. But I love like kind of the way that it has a um, straight body line. I just like the way it hangs at the end. And it has a raglan sleeve, which you can see here in this picture. And it comes with a full schematic, which is lovely. It's really nice when patterns come with a schematic. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see all the details here. A lot, it's very, looks like it's pretty well graded. 
So there, yeah. So that is the Pebbles cardigan from Aklori Designs. So if you are into Tunisian crochet, or if you just started learning and you want to make a garment, one thing that's really nice about Tunisian crochet is it is said to be faster than either crochet or knitting. Um, it's a very, very cool technique. Um, we're, by the way, we are now into patterns that were actually released two weeks ago, but I don't, I'm doing live streams now every other week, so that's, but I wanted to catch you up on everything regardless. <laughs> Oops. Okay, there we go. Good. All right. This next pattern is from one of my favorite designers. This is from Liz Cork. This is her straving sock pattern. I think this is so cool. Um, it features this lovely textured stitch pattern and here it is on her Etsy store. We can see it. Let me close that. We can look at a close up of the stitch pattern itself. Do, 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 do. Come on. Oh my gosh. There we go. Oh, darn it. There we go. You can see the close up of the stitch pattern. Uh, it just has this lovely kind of meandering zigzag pattern. It's so cool. Really lovely. It looks like a traditional flap and gusset heel. Or is that a straw? I think it's flap and gusset. Let's see. Does she say? I feel like there was a pattern recently that I saw that was a strong heel. And I'm like, which one was it? Oops. Wrong thing to click on. Straving is Scott's word for wander. These socks feature a lace pattern with a zigzagging path, wandering from side to side. It's a relaxing knit. So yeah, that is that pattern. Also this pattern, by the way, uh, if you are interested, she with Bluebell Yarn Knits, or yarn, sorry, let me try that again. If you're interested, the featured yarn in this sample is from Bluebell Yarn, and they are selling a kit for this sock pattern. If you're interested, there is a link on uh, Fiber Happenings, knitsforitsat.com slash Fiber Happenings. There is a link to both the Etsy store and to Bluebell Yarn if you want to buy the kit. So go back here, and we're gonna close that. Oh, oh, this one. This was actually one of my favorite new patterns that came out a couple weeks ago. This is a crochet pattern. Um, this is a new one from Rachie Nguyen Designs. And it is the Adrift Wrap. And I just think this is so calming and lovely. Uh, I'm going to go over to the Etsy store. Oops, there we go. Come on. There we go. I'm going to go over to the FC store so we can get a closer look. A lot of Rachie Nguyen's uh, wraps and shawls have very, they're all crochet and they have very lacy details. And this one got me excited because there's still lacy details to it, but it's not as open as some of her other projects. And you do have um, sections of more solid crochet. And I just thought it was something a little different than some of her other designs that I've seen recently. And it's just so lovely. It reminds these colors, I totally get drawn in by colors. And these colors remind me of beach glass. Uh, if you are familiar with what beach glass is. Uh, it's glass that's been on the beach and it's kind of been worn down by the sand and everything. It's just so, so pretty. So pretty. Um, I was very excited when I saw that pattern. I was like, that's a crochet project I could get into. Crochet is not always my, I enjoy crochet, but I have to kind of be in the mood for it. All right. There were so many. Two weeks ago, there were so many new pattern releases. I feel like I'm having to race through them. So my apologies. I ranted quite a bit today. <laughs> uh, this is from Sarah Dawn, Sarah Dawn Designs. This is her Celtic hood. She has done a hoodie project. I think this is so neat. Let me, where's this one? This picture here, you can see really what it is. So it kind of goes over the shoulders and then it's a hood on top. Um, I just think it's really neat. It has this lovely cable um, pattern at the top of the hood 
And the construction of this involves knitting both flat and in the round. So there's some really interesting construction technique with this pattern, but reading through it, she gives details of kind of the construction techniques involved in the listing itself. And reading through it, it's all very approachable. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this was from Sarah Dawn Designs. Okay. Are we near the, I think, was that it? Yes, oh, that was actually the last one. Oh my gosh, such a large, <laughs> there were so many patterns that came out two weeks ago, and then there are two more this week, and I'm like, did I reach them all? But that was all the patterns that have come out uh, and that are featured on the fiber, or I'm sorry, on fiber happenings from the past two weeks. So I think, that is everything for today. I hope that Pattern Spotlight didn't go by too quickly for you. I want to thank you. So I've mentioned it. Sorry. I got to stop, calm down, <laughs> and go through this. So first of all, um, I'm going to start wrapping things up now. Uh, I mentioned a couple times, but I will mention again. Again, that uh, my upcoming video is going to be my epic review on n utilizing a nine inch circular for the first time. Oh, there's tape stuck to that. There we go. A nine inch circular for the first time. Uh, I definitely have thoughts on this. I have opinions on this. Um, kind of as a supplemental, I've also been testing out using a nine inch circular for uh, sock knitting, which... I will probably like insert a from the edit uh, thoughts about that. Um, I decided to do that as I was editing my video. So, uh, but yes, keep an eye out for that. If you are not already, make sure that you are subscribed to my channel and you hit the notification bell because that will let you know whenever I upload a new video or I start a live stream. If you have not already, please like this video, share this video. If you're watching on replay, uh, you know, please join in the conversation and comment down in the comment section because uh, I do read comments. I still try to reply to them and this conversation about the need for speed and continental versus English knitting. We never talk about Portuguese knitting. <laughs> you know, this conversation can be ongoing for sure. Mr. Me, I'm so sick of crochet. Of course, I'm 90% through sewing in 300 loose ends as a granny square to sew. Oh, yeah, Afghan. I was enjoying it at one point. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I feel you on that, Mr. Me. I am, well, I'm very, very far behind. I'm, like, two months behind on my temperature blanket. But I am doing a, I'm doing a Tunisian crochet, uh, temperature blanket, but I'm doing like entrelac squares. I have so many ends to weave in. I'm going to have so many ends to weave in. <laughs> Mr. Me, that was awesome. Congrats again. Thank you. Um, so yes. So next week's video will be the review. Uh, in two weeks, we will have another Knit Tea Live. That is the plan. Of course, things can always change if you want to keep up with what is happening with the channel, what is happening with me, my random thoughts. You can follow me on social media. You can find all my social media down in the description box. And is that everything? Also, 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 um, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the, there we go, at the beginning of the video, but down in the description box, you will find my affiliate links if you utilize one of my affiliate links when you're shopping, which means you click on it, it takes you to a place where you can buy something you might be interested in. If you make a purchase, I may then earn a small commission. And these commissions help support my channel. They get reinvested back into my channel. Uh, it helps me buy yarn for reviews, for demonstration purposes. It helps me buy needles for me to review and for demonstration purposes and et cetera, et cetera. It helps me upgrade equipment so I can keep improving my channel and hopefully growing this community. Uh, also, if you'd like to help support my channel, you can, there's still time, contribute a super chat. Uh, which is kind of a live stream tip 
But if you're watching on the replay, you can always buy me a coffee. Uh, my buy me a coffee is down in the description box. And right now my goal for with my buy me a coffee tips, I always have a goal with them so you can see what they're going to go to. And my goal right now is to actually fund another year of knitswhereitsat.com maintaining my website. Um, and so I can keep doing fiber happenings and also maintain the fiber indie list. So if you'd like to help out with that, it would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, again, link down in the description box. Did I get through all my cheeky plugs? I think I got through all my cheeky plugs. Okay. So Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I hope this new time works well for you. I It definitely worked better for me. <laughs> like, it just does. Um, but I appreciate so much for you coming and joining in with the conversation, whether it's live or on the replay. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for helping me reach a thousand subscribers. And if you're, again, if you're not subscribed at our already, please hit subscribe. All right. I think that's everything. I think that's everything. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. I hope you have a great week ahead. As always, happy health and happy knitting. Bye.